Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And tonight, and it is tonight, well, it's tonight in the US, but it is daytime in New Zealand where this case comes from. This is the case of what they call heavenly creatures. Uh, that's because a movie was made uh, with that name based on a poem one of the girls wrote. But it's also known, the proper name is the Parker Hume murder case. So I want to welcome everybody who's here in the chat room. Um, some hopefully from that neck of the woods. Uh, let me see who's here. Um, <clears throat> hold on a second. <clears throat> I'll get myself together. Can you all hear me? Can you all see and hear me, by the way? Uh, Christine is here. Naomi is here. Oh, Naomi says, I love the movie Heavenly Creatures. We'll be interested to see how it compares with the facts. Um, I want to tell you that I searched high and low for the movie. It is not available on Amazon. It's not available on any other channel that I can find. I try to find it on YouTube. I got little bits and pieces here and there. Um, I even tried Daily Motion, which sometimes you can get it on. And I got like a, I got like a 45 minute movie that was <laughs> just pieces that were ripped out of the movie. <laughs> and it really didn't make a whole lot of sense. And I was like, this just, just isn't quite right. And then there was no, you know, it was like half a movie, but in the, not one half or the other half, just a whole bunch of pieces <laughs> making some kind of new movie. Um, so I don't know why it's not available. It's it's considered to be a great movie. And for some reason, um, yeah, you can buy it on Amazon for, I can't remember if it was a small fortune or just, you know, more than I'd want to pay. But you, yeah, I'd love to have seen the whole actual movie. Um, Florence is here. Christine is here. Anne is here. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Sandra is here. Lisa N is here. So you should be knowing this one, right, Lisa N? Um, let's see. VLW is here. Uh, Jim is here. And Lila is here. And we say howdy here. Uh, yes, it is a fascinating case. That it is. That's why That's why when somebody recommended it, I said, yeah, I'll go with it. Molly is here. Um, and let me see if I can see it. By Florence is here. If I... Now I start saying people's names over again. Carrie is here because <laughs> I can't remember what I said. All right. Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, I watched it. I wonder if they took it down. I, I it, Lots of made up fantasy sequences in it and I did not buy it. Interesting because a lot of the story is about the girls and they're fantasizing. And I, I know that was included because the little pieces I saw had a lot of running around imagining, you know, being princesses and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't know how that worked out in the movie as to what they were trying to tell us, but yeah, um, good question. Um, I don't know. So anyway, uh, Lisa N says, I do know of this case, but I'm sure I will we'll learn lots more in the next hour. All right, I hope so. Okay, getting hot already. <sighs> Sorry. I'm getting ready for this one. This is an interesting case in that this is not a who done it case because everybody know who done it really quick uh, <laughs> because the girls killed these are the two girls um, and they killed her mother okay uh, and after they killed her mother they they were like had blood all over them and they're running around giggling and saying things they shouldn't be saying and and one of the police officers who was helping the girls get out guess out of their bloody clothes. Um, <laughs> This is this is what he heard from one of them, which just kind of shows you how badly it all went. The old girl took a bit more killing than we thought. <laughs> I'm going to say you don't have much of a defense, you know, and I'll explain more about why this case went this this supposed they were trying to make it look like an accidental death and did the worst job ever. Uh, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But. So this is not a who done it. It's a why would these girls do it? And it fascinates people because it's unusual for teen girls to be killing, especially back in and this was like this happened in 1954. So we hear more about that today. Um, but we did, you know, back then it was a massive shock. And and especially this girl who came from a very fine family, um, well known in town. Uh, she was from a lesser family what you call lesser family, uh, regular folk. Uh, but with, with her being involved, it was like, oh my God. And it became a huge, huge case. So I'm going to be examining, I'm going to let you know fairly quickly what happened. And then I'm going to examine why it happened. 
And I'm going to, I think, introduce some ideas that I don't think anybody else has introduced about how teens think and how things can go badly when things all end up coming together. Uh, so I think that's that's kind of an important thing to try to understand. And I'm going to try to bring some of my own experiences into it so uh, so you can laugh at me. <laughs> anyway, before I start, please, uh, if you'd like to be in the chat room, uh, my chat room is uh, closed to the general public. It's for patrons only. Uh, it's, it's five bucks a month and you can join eight or sometimes even more um, shows every month. And then after I finish uh, the live show with my patrons, I do put it up. Every the, Everybody in the public can see it. You don't have to pay a dime to see my show <laughs> um, because I want everybody to learn. So that's why everything is available. Uh, but please do subscribe. You don't have to pay a penny for that. Just subscribe to the channel, like the video, share in true crime groups, share in places where people want to actually learn things uh, because I think it's important. And uh, there are other ways to support the channel. Find books, clicking dollar signs below. And eh, Okay, that's that. Now, I want to get to this. I want to get to this case. Um, okay, so what is wrong with these girls? <laughs> <laughs> That's what you have to ask right up front. What is wrong with these girls? Let me give you a really quick rendition of this case. And, oh, before I start, I want to tell you where I got my information from. I want to give a shout out um, to... I'll give a shout out here to Stephanie Harlow. Uh, I want to do this because she has a two-part series. Uh, the first part, I think, is most important for me because I'm not going to do more than a five minute spiel on this. And she does an hour on the entire uh, history of the girls, their families and so on and so forth. Um, she's got a few amusing comments in there, which made me laugh. Um, uh, she's a lot soft, more soft hearted than I am, but <laughs> you know, that Stephanie is a, uh, maybe she's a nicer person than I am, but anyway, um, she, but, uh, but she's got some really funny little, little comments in there. And um I really enjoyed it, and I just want to let you know that's a place to go to. to if you're not going to buy a book on this case, this is a great place to go to get a whole layout of what happened in the case, part one and part two. Now, if you want to take a little bit more time, and I did, I read this book. It's called Anne Perry and the Murder of the Century. And some of you are going to say, "Who the hell is Anne Perry? Isn't she? Isn't she like a novel? Uh, shouldn't she write murder mysteries? Yes, and I'm going to explain that later. And if you already know, don't say anything. Um, but anyway, Peter Graham wrote this book about this particular murder, about these girls, and I think it's an excellent book. And I have trouble reading true crime books a lot of times because I find them they like to put out point out the gore part of it and all that. I found this interesting. He really did very good. Um, research. And I love the way he laid it out. Some people thought it was boring, but I did not. I found it interesting to the end. And I appreciate any guy who can, who puts Hawaii in his book and puts an apostrophe between the last two eyes on Hawaii. So <laughs> kudos to you. So that's, these are two places you can get information. You can't probably get the movie unless you pay for it. Um, so that's where I got my information from. Um, now what happened with these girls? All right. Let's go for it. The Parker Hume murder case began in the city of Christchurch, South Island, New Zealand on 22 June, 1954. I was born in 1955. Oh, yes. Wow, happened before I was even born. <laughs> that's that's good these days because <laughs> so much is happening mm, yeah. <laughs> after I was born. That uh, means I've been here too long. Uh, when Honor, I can't pronounce her name quite right. Honor Rock. Anna Ra, uh, they call her Nora, but Anna Ra or Hana Ra, it's H-O-N-O-R-A-H. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, but I say Anna Ra, but her short name is uh, uh, Nora Reaper. And her, she's also known as Anna Ra Parker because ahem, we'll find out uh, that um, apparently she was married to, she was with a man named Parker and and, and her daughter always thought they were married and it turned out that they weren't married because he was married to another woman he never divorced. So they were living together as husband and wife, but she actually never uh, actually was married to him. So her, her real name was Parker, but she just took on her husband, her, oh, well, her, you know, significant other she was living with and had two children with, no, four, four children with, four children with. Um, and therefore she called herself uh, Reaper. Um, so 
anyway, she was killed by her teenage daughter, Pauline. I we'll call her Pauline Parker because then they found out what the mother's name really was. So they now call her Pauline Parker and not Pauline Reaper. Gets a little confusing. Pauline Parker and her best her best friend, Juliet Hume. All right. Now, Parker was 16 at the time and her friend was 15 at the time. Uh, so the murder inspired many plays, novels, fiction, nonfiction and films, including Peter Jackson's Heavenly Creatures in 1994, the one I can't actually get to watch unless I pay money for it. All right, so who are these? Who's who are these girls, and how did they end up together? And how did all of this turn into a disaster? Okay, so Pauline Parker um, was born in uh, 1938. She met Juliet, who was born in London. She was she was she was from New Zealand, uh, but she was from London. All right, they were both in the early teens. Parker came from a working class background. Now, let me show you the difference between their backgrounds here, because this is a, actually a very important part of, of the story. Um, so essentially, Juliet lived here, you say, in this lovely home. And Pauline lived in this not so thrilling place, which actually uh, her parents actually had to, they were like, lived on one floor and they rented on the other floor. I think they rented to four different people. They weren't doing well, okay? They weren't doing the best. They were struggling through life. They were rich as crap, okay? And well-respected in the community. So two very different lifestyles. Um, and that has an effect on the girls as far as why they got together. Um, so now uh, let's go Let's go back to the girls. Let's go back here. Okay, so um, Pauline... Her father was Herbert Reaper and her mother was Honor, Honora Parker. They were living together, but not actually married. It wasn't public knowledge until the trial. Um, Juliet Hume, over here, immigrated to New Zealand with her parents in 1948. Uh, let's see, I have a picture of that. Okay, there's her family emigrating. Uh, this is actually a picture of the two girls right at, after the trials. They still look really happy, don't they? Happy. They're together, at least at that moment. They're happy. Uh, so... This is the, that's their family. I can't, I, it's hard to come up with a picture oddly of, um, of uh, Pauline's family. I can't find one picture of her father. And considering her mother was the one murdered, you would think you'd be able to find a picture of her, wouldn't you? But I only found, let's see if this is the picture. Okay, so this is, this is Juliet's parents. Um, her father was a physicist uh, on the left, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, and I kind of think of him as you know, maybe suffering from Asperger's because he, you know, he was a scientist and I think he just didn't, didn't necessarily connect with people very well and relate, which may be part of the problem Juliet grew up with. And then there's her mother who her mother is considered like super, like, like she was like, um, kind of a cougar actually. No, she, <laughs> she, um, she, she was very, very, um, she was she was very well educated. She 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 thought highly of herself. She ran high society, but she was also considered very sexy. And I'm not sure I see it in this picture, so I'm not quite sure that this is just a bad makeup picture. But she was considered like really hot, and re men really liked her, and she really liked men. Not so much her husband because he was kind of dull. Um, so this is a picture, the only picture I could find on the internet, supposedly of the woman who was murdered. I don't know why it's not a it's not out there. I don't actually even I couldn't actually even say for sure this is her because I could not find it in more than like one site. And this was on a on a obituary type site, a memory site. So um yeah, a, a little confusing there as to why the mom uh you know who was murdered is like kind of ignored. But anyway, let's go on. So now th this guy here, uh Henry Hume was a physicist who was the rector of the University of Canterbury in Christchurch. He like he was this huge guy in London, and uh, then he got involved in the Manhattan Project, and then he ended up being this rector of a university, which he wasn't exactly the best at, I must say. So anyway, the two girls then attended Christchurch Girls School. All right, and that's where they met um, and became little little buddies. Uh, and one of the reasons they claimed that they became such good buddies was because 
This is it. Yeah, this is it. That's why I want. Okay. So the, this is, oh, where's the school? Hold on a second. Yeah, that, that's the school in the background. Um, So they're going to the school and they, now when the, uh, let's take a look at the picture here. Just to, just to point this out. Juliet, very attractive girl. Let me show you another picture of Juliet. This is Juliet. Beautiful girl. She was brilliantly educated. Uh, she was, she thought highly of herself, believe you me. And <laughs> then, she, then she met this girl. As you can see in the school photo, <laughs> Pauline was not a happy girl. And she was uh, not well liked. And she was considered weird and strange and, and scary. Okay. But they both had had a physical ailments in their life and they weren't able to like run around like those other girls. So she had had tuberculosis. She had had a problem with her leg, which she had uh, was slightly shorter now. And she had a little bit of a limp and she had severe pain in her leg. And they had this, this medical background um, that wasn't pleasant. Uh, they both suffered and they were running about. So they somehow got together and started chit chatting and became bosom buddies. Um, now, uh, fascinating thing about these girls. I mean, that they ended up this very wealthy girl and this not very wealthy girl. What attracted them to each other is one of the questions in this particular uh, particular case. Now, I'm going to get to that later about teens and girl teens, because a lot of people do not understand or remember what it was like to be a girl teen if you were one. Um, and I do remember, so I'm going to I'm going to explain that a little later. Uh, but I just want to point out who they were first. So, uh, by the way, both of them suffered from not exactly being favored children, shall we say. She spent, her family spent most of the time away from her. Her mother could care less that she was spending time with her. Sent, the, sent this girl away. She went, when she had tuberculosis, they sent her away. Uh, when they just didn't want to deal with her, they sent her down to, uh, to stay with people when she was a very small child because they were too busy. Um, she got sent away a lot. Her mother... Her mother. Well, let's see. Let's look back at her mother again. Um, let me see. Where's my picture of her mother? Okay. So her mom here, I would call her a massive narcissist. I, I believe she's extremely narcissistic. And she, I think she was too involved with herself to give a crap about her kid other than once in a while going, oh yeah, sure. Yeah. She's wonderful. Look, look, at look. look. Yeah. She had other people take care of her. She didn't want to waste her time with her. And I think that caused a great deal of um, damage. And when you have a father who is also kind of not there, uh, I believe that Juliet grew up without the proper um, uh, connection to her parents. And that is a psychological condition. So that is the problem for her. In this case, um, I, I think she just had a working class family. They struggled. They had issues. Um, first child died. Um, the second child was her older sister. She was kind of like the golden girl. Then she came along and she had issues and problems and wasn't the prettiest thing. And so, um, and then the fourth child had down syndrome. And so the family had, was overwhelmed with issues. And I think that her mom probably went back and forth between trying to help her and just getting fed up, especially if she had a personality that was difficult to deal with. So both these girls weren't getting along with their families and therefore, they found each other. So let's see what now what happened. All right. So they both attended Christchurch Girls School. That's right here. Um, uh, and both girls, they had debilitating illnesses as children. Okay. And they initially bonded over it. All right. They both supposedly romanticized the being sick. Uh, you know, a lot of girls do that for some strange reason. It's like, oh, you know, I was sick and I, I was lying there. And, you know, they, they, <laughs> this again, I'm going to talk about in a bit about girls and teen fantasies. As their friendship developed, Parker and Hume formed an elaborate fantasy life together. They wrote plays, books, and stories centered in this world. And by the way, I want to point out, Juliet, IQ off the charts. Well, her father was a physicist and one of the most brilliant men in the world. IQ off the charts. Probably pretty normal. <laughs> she could write. And, and, and they make a big deal of the fact these girls can write. Now, I want to point out that if y'all, if you remember, once upon a time, people used to actually write. <laughs> girls used to actually get training in school to write. They actually did a thing called reading books. So they read a lot of good books as opposed to today where they're on TikTok. So they can't write for crap. So 
I think some of this is over exaggerated into you know when we look back, oh my God, look at the things they wrote. Hey, that's what girls did back then. That's why there was so much poetry written in the old days, which isn't so much today. And where girls wrote diaries, nobody writes diaries anymore. They just you know write emails and stuff like that. They, it's a different world. And you have to take that into consideration. I don't think what these girls were doing was as abnormal as people uh, claim it is. And I'll get to that. All right. So they wrote plays, books, stories, and then the girls became nearly obsessed with one another. Again, it's called best friends. It's kind of a soulmate. All right. To the point where Parker's parents became concerned that the girls were engaged in a sexual relationship. Homosexuality at the time was considered a serious mental illness. So there was, the girls spent a lot of time together and they had such a, a a close relationship. And sometimes, you know, they, they stayed overnight together and snuggled. Again, not necessarily unusual. Could they have had a homosexual relationship? Could they have been budding lesbians? Absolutely. But then again, maybe not. Um, but the parents were concerned because that was kind of a eh, big no-no back then. All right. So let's see. The Humes also had concerns, uh, both families continued to, but they had concerns, but both families continued to let the girls see each other. Her family, because her mother didn't want to deal with her, and so she had somebody else to take the place of her mom. She was good with that. Hey, take her off my hands. For her mother, uh, you know, she was associated with a, a high-class girl. She was glad to get this surly, unfriendly, unpleasant child out of her house, thank God, to go someplace else. So for both parents, um, their relationship with her was a relief, shall we say. All right. So then what happened was uh, at some point, these two girls, the her parents, they were getting divorced or splitting up, essentially. Her mother had an affair with another man. And the father was like, yeah, whatever. And then <laughs> father's going to go back to England. So the idea was that she would go to South, South Africa. And, and she, of course, they were horrified. They're, they're going to be separated. They're, you know, not going to, you know, hey, how could you do this to us? So because of that, this is how her mother ended up getting murdered. Let me explain the basic details of it. I'm going to go, go into the, the thinking of these, these, these two girls. So what happened was her parents, um, and I agree um, that uh, one of the things that I just think that Stephanie Harlow had right was her mother was a piece of work. <laughs> yeah, she really was a piece of work. And her mother and her father they told the girls that they would talk to um, Pauline's mother because Pauline's mother would be the one that would say, you can't go. They said they were willing to have, to have Pauline come with them because they were such good friends. And they were, you know, she was 16. She was studying, you know, she could get a job, go to school, whatever. They had tons of money over here. So the concept was that what the heck, if we're going to take her to South Africa, yes, yeah, we'll let your best friend come. That's what they said. In reality, they didn't, they weren't actually intending to have her come. They were kind of happy that they could get, get her to South Africa and knock her out of the picture. So they basically lied and said they're going to talk to her mother, which they didn't. Because of this, uh, they, the girls believed, and especially Pauline believed, that her mother was, a, was the problem. That since her family was willing to have her come, her, her mother was the one in the way. And that's why they decided to kill her. And they did. So they got together and killed her with the idea that once she was out of the way, then they would be free. She would be free. Her father couldn't deal with her anyway. So he'd be happy that she goes to South Africa and these two girls could be together. Ta -da! Except they did a very poor job <laughs> and killing, killing um, her mother. They claimed it was an accident, but they like beat her to death with a brick 40 times and strangled her. So, you know, <laughs> it didn't go well. <laughs> they got caught really quickly. They got convicted um, of the crime. Uh, they got convicted uh, here. The a jury found two uh, New Zealand girls sane. They both got just five years, and then they they went on their way uh, to into private life after that. Okay. Now I want to go back and talk about what happened with these girls. 
because this is, I think, is the really important part about this, this whole particular, the whole particular story is not that they killed somebody and only got five freaking years, but that there, that they had some issues. And what was, what were the issues that they had that had them be like this? And I want to go back to this picture. Okay. I'm going to talk about teen life. All right. Uh, because this to me is the critical part then, but just before I go to my whole thing on this, I'm just going to check in on you guys over in the chat room and see what you're thinking. Um, <laughs> um, let's see. <laughs> I'm not going to go there yet. Okay. Um, so we're talking about audible here. Okay. I'm not going to get into the, uh, uh, the other issue. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to go to this now. I didn't see any particular comments on where we were right now. So I'm going to go to this now. This to me is the crux of everything. And I hope I present something here that is a little more unique uh, because I'm going to talk from my heart and from my experience. Um, teen years. Do you remember them? I do. I, I didn't have good teen years, <laughs> by the way. I was kind of like Pauline. I wasn't real popular in school. I hated school. I wasn't popular, but I did get a best friend. I did. Um, thank God. And so I had somebody that, that I felt was important to me and I was important to her. My parents were good people, but they were kind of part of the, um, let's see, I was, I was born in 55. So by the time I hit high school, it was, okay, let me do the, <laughs> okay, 14 years old. So six, 69. Yeah, 69, 70 was when I entered high school. I got graduated in 72 a year early. But so as there's three years. So it was just the beginning of the 70s. My parents um, were up, they were, they, we were fairly well off. My father was a GS 18 in the government and also was a, a, an engineer. And so he was, he was a little bit, you know, same way uh, that I think that Juliet's dad was a good man, a uh, kind, but you know, he didn't like have big conversations. My mother was a new Englander and was very short on, <laughs> on she was a very, as I would say, person that did things the proper way. Um, and as, as, a, as a pair, as a parents, they didn't talk to us a whole lot. Um, they didn't, there was no drinking, there was no drugs. We had a safe home. Myself, my two sisters, we grew up, everything was safe, but we didn't have any deep discussions. We learned things kind of on our own. And, and um, I, I was kind of an oddball. And so for me to have finally somebody who was my friend was important to me. Um, now, something else I want to point out about the teen years before I go to the friendship issue. Do you remember, because I do, I can't, I wish I could get it back without drugs, <laughs> but I remember that everything was brighter. Um, the land, the, the, everything was brighter out there. You know, the sun was brighter, the leaves were brighter, everything was bigger and brighter and everything was uh, more intense than it is now. Um, I felt a vibration in my body, a vibration that almost like speed, like, oh, I don't know, opioids. I've never done opioids, <laughs> but you know, zzz, like, and you felt powerful. You felt excited and that ran through your body. And as far as sexuality went, I didn't know crap, <laughs> you know, because those were the days when we didn't grow up with anything. So I, I, I do remember sneaking into my mother's bedroom once and going into her nightstand and there was a book in there. It was just a medical encyclopedia, but I finally read about sex. I'm like, well, that's how they do it. <laughs> this was probably when I was 14, 15. I had no clue. Um, but but yet I was a girl. And so blood fl flowed through my body. And I remember feeling that feeling that, you know, you that teen feeling of very, very easily feeling very sensual and, and excited over very little anything because I because I think the first boy I kissed when I was 16 years old and you know I was like oh my god and I like burned for hours <laughs> <You know? laughs> and um you know so this was a time when you had these feelings this these things rolling through you now also 
one of the things they talk about with these girls is that they had this magical world that they they wrote stories and they and 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 they created this this uh whole like fantasy world that, that's called daydreaming and when you're a teenager you daydream and i'm going to tell you what my daydream was because i was a weird child um i was i was in love with uh um musicals my father one of the greatest things my father ever did was take us to musicals in washington i think it was a washington opera company and we got to see these wonderful musicals and the one i loved the most was brigadoon and then it came out as a movie with Robert Goulet. And, okay, so I'm a weird teen. So <laughs> I had two great fantasies. One was I was going to go to Scotland. And now Brigadoon would appear every 100 years. <laughs> That's the my mystical thing about it. And so uh, a guy named Tommy, who was played by Robert Goulet in the movie, accidentally fell into this place on, when that 100 year they popped onto they popped onto Earth in the every hundred years and he fell in love with a girl named Fiona. So I want to be Fiona. And then I bought Robert Goulet records. And I, I remember being in my room playing Robert Goulet records. Oh my God. You know, and I just envisioned Robert Goulet. I mean, okay. That's weird for a, a teenage girl. It should have been a rock star or something. And the monkeys or the Beatles. <laughs> I was in love with Robert Goulet. <laughs> he was handsome and he had a voice. Oh my God. And he had, he did Brigadoon. So I had this fantasy. I remember twirling around in my bedroom dancing and thinking about, oh, I'm going to Brigadoon now. And I remember all this crap vaguely, but I remember it. And it felt very exciting and it was delightful. Now, mind you, I knew Brigadoon did not exist. And I knew I was never going to be with Robert Goulet. I wasn't an idiot. <laughs> and I don't think these girls were idiots either. That's the thing that bugs me about a lot of people. They believe that this, what's called, um, this is a daydream. There's a word for it. Let me find it here maladaptive daydreaming, where it's characterized by a vivid and richly detailed daydreams, which, which can be a form of escapism and become compulsive. All right. Then they say it's to get, out, get over trauma. Well, I don't know what my trauma was. You know, it wasn't popular. <laughs> but I think a lot of teenagers have a lot of daydreaming. They daydream about what they could be, about, you know, things that aren't mundane. See, that's the problem. You got mundane. And you got magical. And somewhere with that buzzing in your body, you'd rather have magical than mundane. So there you go. You, 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 you fantasize. And as long as you're not fantasizing negative things, it's not necessarily bad. We even fantasize as adults. We fantasize every day of our lives. We fantasize like, I'm going to go to this party tonight. I wonder who I'm going to meet. We fantasize about it. You know, I have a YouTube channel. I fantasize about somebody um, interviewing me five years from now and saying, so Pat Brown, <laughs> how did you become a big YouTuber? <laughs> I like that fantasy. <laughs> you know, we all fantasize. We're human beings. So these girls fantasize. Not unusual. Now, I want to say this about fantasizing and sexuality and about girls and girls. When girls have a best friend that they trust and can share their fantasies with, they often fantasize things that are slightly sexual, uh, like they play parts because they're not with where they're not with men. Maybe they never want to be with men. I'm not going to say that these two girls were not homosexual or lesbian. I don't know what their what their inclinations were. But I know a lot of girls, and uh, this is so true with boys, they're like, yeah, hey, I'm doing that. <laughs> but girls will play games, pretend things. You know how kids do doctor? Well, when girls get to be teens, they do fantasy things sometimes. They'll do things like, let's play, you be the princess, and I'll be the bad guy. <laughs> and the bad guy comes in and ravishes the princess. And so there's a little bit of touching going on there where the girl's like, I'm not, I'm not consenting to this, but... I'm consenting to this, but I'm not really consenting to this. You see how that works. And so she gets gets to have a little sexual excitement. And both of them, then they change, they change parts. So now the other girl becomes the princess and the prince arrives. <laughs> you know, so sometimes girls do touchy things. Not that they necessarily are being a romantic lovers, but they're playing games as romantic, romantic games but in fantasy form. And people don't like to talk about this or admit this, but that is the way it works. So 
Not with every girl. Some of you are going, I never did that crap. <laughs> And I'm not saying I did. Okay. But I'm just saying this happens. Okay. So the girls, you know, having a rich fantasy life and having a great friendship. I want, I want to show you this. This is my best friend. And um, she was my best friend in high school and she moved to Scotland and she wrote me these letters. You can see, see them. This is teenage girl stuff. This is one letter, and I had hundreds, a hundred of these letters. But I love the way it starts. I just want to read you this so you can get the feeling of how these girls work. Dear my greatest friend. Aw. Hi, thanks so much for your letter. It arrived exactly three minutes ago. See, girls are, <laughs> girls are like really, like sometimes really, really um, emotional and excited. Um, exactly three minutes ago. Thanks also for your great picture. It's really great. <laughs> She wasn't the greatest writer, but okay. Now I've got one of you and Michelle. Yours is bigger, of course. I don't even remember who Michelle was. There's a photo machine at Woolworths here, a little booth where you smile and it takes about 10 little pictures. I promise to send you one. Bad luck for you. Ha <laughs> ha. I think I told you about what presents I got for Christmas. And then it just goes on. And then, you know, I was kind of surprised because like, Somewhere here in their letter, she decides to tell a dirty joke, which I was shocked at when I reread this. A man and a woman went into a bedroom together, shut the door, and drew the curtains. The woman took off her bra, and the man said, what are those? And she answered, those are my hills. <laughs> then the man took off his shirt, and the woman said, what is that? And he said, that is my thunder, <laughs> his hair on his chest. I'm not going to go further. <laughs> But it's a goofy, goofy teenage girl joke. Like the first time you recognize, oh my God, that's how sex works. You know, um, but this is my best friend. And and she could write me these things. And then I took them and I put them in a, you know, with a ribbon and I tied them all up and it was grand. Now, you might ask, why did my best friend and I not kill anybody? <laughs> yeah. Why do we not go down that route? And why did these two girls, why did these two girls get to that point? Because that is the issue of this whole thing. Why did these two girls turn into killers? Okay. Um, I'm going to just stop here for a second um, <laughs> and see what you have to say. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, isn't that nice? AD first, uh, New patron, first live. Glad you were here. Uh, Lila says, it's not unusual for teen girls to form a strong obsession with each other, seeming like or perhaps verging on a homosexual relationship that goes beyond the ability of adults to understand. Yes. And I think it's very different from what boys do. And I can't comment on how boys think because I'm not one. OK, so I can't go there. I do know that a lot of men, when they're in like the military, they have those buddies that they for lifelong buddies forever because they're in the military together. So I know they have their own thing, but I just can't express that. But girls, oh my God. Um, yes. And, and we had, we had feelings, but there were feelings of great friendship of soulmates, but not soulmates in the sense of that we're getting married or anything. Now this, again, I, I'm not saying that some girls didn't feel, sexual feelings towards each other as a gay woman might feel, right? I That wasn't me, but yeah, but there was a lot going on. Um, let's see. Uh, Lisa N says, they remind me a bit of the Bronte sisters creating this fantasy world together. Yes. And they were very, again, people used to write better in those days and read a lot of things that were very, very, Vibrant, shall we say? Um, they're they're like Shakespeare. Uh, uh, I think I actually I don't have a I have one of these here, and this reminds me of this because uh, let's see if I can find it. Mm, eh, maybe not. <laughs> I, I took so many. I have so many things here. I, I'm not sure I can see all the things I I put down here. So, uh, but Shakespeare, he had the 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 rape of Lucretia. Was that who it was? Anyway, but. A lot of times it's called ravishing back in the day. <laughs> People were ravished. They were raped, but they were called ravished. Like, oh, no, don't do that. And then they raped them and they're like ravished, you know. But there, that was a thing that 
you know, because of the romanticizing of such things, the flowery language, that it was something that people got involved with as kind of an exciting fantasy world. And it didn't mean that they believed it existed, but they liked playing in it. And I, I just think that's not necessarily abnormal. Um, <laughs> I hope you eventually write an autobiography, Pat. I actually have one that I am working on. Uh, so I, yeah, I may get there. <laughs> um, uh, Lisa S. says, my cousin, hi, Lisa, my cousin and I would raid our grandmother's closet and try on her dresses and heels, stuff our bras and give a fashion show. Oh, yeah, the stuffing of the bras. Absolutely. Uh, Nancy, hi, Nancy. I had a closely emotional relationship with a girl, under the girl at work. Everyone thought we were lesbians. See, it, because this is the way it works. Um, Lisa, yes, I thought of that also. Rich fantasy lives, writing very close bonds. Um uh, Anne says, there was no love in those girls' home, no attachment so they could kill and be liberated. I, I'm going to get to that in a minute, which is exactly one of my points. Wait, somebody else has something. <laughs> As a teen girl, Angela says, I was the star of my own world. And that is also true. Now, there was a, there was a, uh, let's see if I can find the line that, that I thought that was, this was a great line by um, Stephanie. Let me find the line because it made me laugh. Uh, what I do with it? Hold on a second. I thought it was just a great line. So she said, let me find it. It's too good. It's too good. I have to read it to you. Um, oh, come on. Oh, here. Here it is. No, that's not it. Hold on a second. What happened to it? Oh, it's such a good line. Where did I put it? Sorry. Hold on a second. Sometimes things don't, don't go over. No, darn it. Basically, she said that um, the thing about the girls was that um, that um, Pauline like thought the world of of that that she was the best thing ever. That Juliet was the best thing she'd ever seen in her life, the most wonderful. And Juliet thought the same thing too. <laughs> That's why they got along, and that is part of the psychology here, which I will get to. Oh my God, let's see. BLW said you and Robert Goulet and me and Pernell Roberts. <laughs> Oh, adolescence. Hey, I'm still, I still have a thing for Robert Goulet. I love that man's voice. I absolutely do. Oh, look at Lisa says, Pat, you're so right. I had a cousin I played parts with. This is what happens. And, and I just want to, I have to bring that up because it's reality. And I think the problem people have with this, the, what the girls did was they, they, they exploded their, this concept that the the girls had such a fantasy life, that's why they committed the crime. That has nothing to do with it. That is not it. Now, let me explain how that's not it. All right. Because I think this is so important. Okay. The next thing. Oh, they also talk about their religious thoughts. They had this, they went, they had this concept that they were, went to the fourth world or something, and they had this, their own kind of spiritual world. Well, I remember sitting around with a friend going, what do you think? And then we would make up stuff. You think heaven would be like this? And maybe, maybe the devil's a better person. <laughs> we would talk crap. We had that fantasy as well. So, you know, what do we, what do we believe? What, do, what don't we believe? So again, I don't think that's a, a hypothetical spiritual world. is not again, abnormal for teenage teenagers or these teenage girls. Now, here we go. This is where I think this, the problem comes down to. There is a problem when a pair of girls or a pair of boys or a girl or a girl and a boy, doesn't matter, a couple, isolate themselves from other children and their families or are forced into isolation from other children and their families. They allow themselves to descend into their own made up world. In other words, they don't have a balanced life. So they do have an obsession and it can get to a point where it's unhealthy because they're not they're not balancing it out with other experiences. So they're not involved with other kids and sports and, and their family. And they become this, this little teeny place with this, their own world. And therefore they don't get other opinions and they can then foment stuff that they shouldn't foment. That's true. Now, how do things go wrong? I put, there's three things. All right. You start with number one, normal teen insanity. <laughs> as I've just explained, that's normal teen insanity. And that normal teen insanity is usually uh, balanced by, as I pointed, just pointed out, 
other friends, uh, family, the belief in a future, positive thinking. It balances out so that they can move forward without doing stupid things. Okay, so normal teen fantasy is there for number one. These girls had that. But then they went to number two. Damaged kids become teens. These two were damaged. They both had major issues uh, along the narcissistic continuum to the dangerous uh, part of it. And I'm going to go through some of the different uh, theories on what their psychological issues were. Um, but they definitely were damaged kids. And so now these damaged kids become teens. And these damaged kids become fantasizers during that time. And it is not healthy combo because they're damaged already. The third one, this is where it all goes to hell, right? The third one is teens encounter a dangerous ideation and or a problematic situation. So sometimes teens, instead of having positive fantasies, these girls were just talking, most of the, their fantasies were kind of silly. You know what I mean? They watched all these these, they were into opera and, oh yes, oh, this is there's definitely death scenes in opera and there's a lot of tragedy. That's true. So they had a little bit of an obsession with death, which wasn't healthy. So that's an, that is a dangerous ideation. There are kids today who get into Slender Man and other very, very dangerous ideations and they want to experience what murder is like for the fun of it. That's a dangerous ideation that comes with these three things becoming a normal team, but being damaged and then getting dangerous ideation. And that throws you over the, the over that point of uh, maybe no return. These girls didn't have bizarre ideation in that sense. They had a feeling that they were above everybody else. They thought, and let me read you, this was one dangerous ideation they had. By getting together, they believed that they were above the rest of the world. The rest of the world were worthless little trolls. And they were the brilliant and beautiful ones. And let me read you the poem that she wrote. And I think this poem is, is, is the one that uh, um, that the whole concept of, of heavenly creatures came from. And it is as narcissistic as narcissistic gets. All right. The ones that I worship. There are living among us two dutiful daughters of a man who possesses two beautiful daughters. Not the best opening, in my opinion. All right. The most glorious beings in creation. Oh, they're, they're the high, you know, high, trying to put yourself up there. The most glorious beings in creation. They be the pride and joy of any nation. You cannot know, nor yet try to guess, the sweet soothingness of their caress. The outstanding genius of this pair is understood by few. They are so rare. Compare... Compared with these two, every man is a fool. The world is most honored that they should deign to rule. And above us, these goddesses reign on high. I worship the power of these lovely two. With a, that adoring love known to so few. Tis indeed a miracle one must feel that two such heavenly creatures are real. Both sets of eyes, though different far, hold many mysteries strange. Impassively, they watch the race of man decay and change. Hatred burning bright in the brown eyes with enemies for fuel. Icy scorn glitters in the gray eyes, contemptuous and cruel. Oh, she nailed that one on both of them. Why are men such fools that they will not realize the wisdom that is hidden behind those strange eyes. And these wonderful people are you and I. Not a bad poem, but concerning. <laughs> that is very concerning. The, the ideation there that they, they are so special that she, they owe nothing to anyone and that they do not follow the rules of society that they are only there for themselves is, is frightening. So I want to point that out, that this is dangerous ideation. But then came the real kicker in this, this couple. Because a lot of times what will happen is 
you can have teens that are obsessed. You can have teens with bad ideation, but they, a lot of times if they don't run into a problem, they just go on and eventually get bored with each other and go their own ways. However, when you have a situational crime, and this is one of what was a situational crime, this is not something that necessarily happens again. It's not like serial killers. That, that's not situational. That is, they like killing. They kill, 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 kill. Situational crimes are one-timers. Sometimes it's a, a family annihilator, you know, that gets fed up with, you know, Chris Watts. I don't want to be, I don't want to take care of this, the, my wife and children anymore. I want to go off with this honey. That's a situational crime. In this case, it's a situational crime. Now, I will say this, Chris Watts is a little bit different in the fact that I think no matter what, he would eventually do it <laughs> because he got gets bored. That's, that's, that's a massive psychopathy in him. However, in this case, these girls were had these strong emotions, their best friends, not even if they're, I don't know if they're lovers or not, but their best friend. They're so made for this place and time. These girls wanted to be together because they had nobody in their minds but each other. The parents were damn fools. The parents should have said, look, I, I know these girls got some issues, but we can't break them up like that or, or it's, it's going to be bad news. But that's not what happened. So her parents lied that they were that, that she could go that she could go with them. And she believed her mother wouldn't let them, which is probably correct. So the two of them had a situation which they wanted to fix because they wanted to be together. And they knew if they didn't fix it, she was going to fly off to South Africa and she wasn't going to go. And all their their plans to be together were gonna their daily be together, their 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 intimate relationship and their future was gone because the chances of her earning enough money to eventually get to South Africa when she was older, but and teenagers don't think that far ahead. Like, Hey, you're, we're already old enough. Why don't you just wait a year and then move, you know, find a way down here. Why don't we just keep being pen pals and work our way, but they're intense. So they're like, we have to get rid of the one thing, the one thing that's in our way. And that's mommy. So they plan this crime to kill off mommy uh, because they, they, they also um, were, you could say delusional, but teens often don't think how things are going to work out. So interestingly enough, they plan this crime um, and they didn't, they just planned it so incredibly badly. <laughs> you know, they thought, so the whole, whole crime worked like this for, uh, for these girls. So, let me pull up the basic crime scene here. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Oh, we did. Don't you go missing on me again. Uh, hold on a second. Seriously? <laughs> hold on one second. I've got miss things gone missing again. Hold on, let me find the one I made for this. And I know it's here. Where did it go? Oh, here we go. I don't know. For some reason. it. All right. Crime scene. All right. So what they did was they, the girls decided they were going to ask uh, Pauline's mother, Hey, we're being so, we're half so happy to, you know, we just want, we're, we're being good girls today. Why don't you, we go out and they went to this tea house and have a little snack and then we'll go for a lovely walk down this path. Their idea was the mother would have an accident on this path, you see. And their idea of an accident was that she was going to trip. They were going to drop this little rock and she was going to trip. She was going to look down and, then they were going to hit over the head. They had a brick and a stocking and they were going to hit her over the head and that would do it. And it looked like she fell and hit her head. But you, mind you, what's underneath, there was some like wood and there's no way she would have that kind of damage, even with one hit. So apparently this was the plan. And then when they hit her on the head, it didn't go well. So they ended up hitting her like 40 times and, 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 and supposedly, uh, so Pauline was like whacking her, whacking, 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 because Pauline had a lot of anger in her. She's like whacking, 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 mommy. And and meanwhile, Juliet is trying to help her out. So at some point, Juliet supposedly takes that and whacks her a few times herself. Um, and then Juliet supposedly holds her by the neck on the ground so that so that uh, Pauline can finish her off. Whack, whack, well, Juliet's holding her down because she had damage to hyoid bone here. And um, her whole face was messed up and she was, her skull was crushed. I mean, they really, <laughs> they really whacked her to death now. So then they run off and they, so they run back to this tea house. And I'm like, Oh, mommy, mommy had a mommy. And my mom fell. She, you know, she's had an accident. Oh my God. I think she's dead. 
And the police come out like, what kind of accident is this? <laughs> you got to be out of your mind. This is no accident. Meanwhile, the girls are full of blood all over them, giggling away and saying stupid things. So consequently, yeah, they got nailed really quickly. Um, and they were set, sent, they were found guilty um, and sent to separate prisons um, five years. And then they went into private life after five years because they were both underage at the time. And, and there was a whole argument over, are they insane or weren't they insane? What was their psychological state? In other words, can you blame them for what they did or can't you? So now I'm, I'm going to go and, and describe some of the things that um, the psychiat psychologist said and psychiatrists, uh, the different possibilities um, and who was more responsible. It's interesting. After this happened, Juliet basically said she 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 just she was just there and like, oh, and and then she eventually said, no, I, you know, I, I, it was my best friend and she, she was going to commit suicide if I didn't help her. So therefore I helped her. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously both girls were involved uh, because they, there was a, they, another bright thing, uh, Pauline kept a diary. I don't know if Juliet kept one, but if she did, she was smart enough to get rid of it. But um but uh, Pauline kept a diary and she's like, oh, it's almost we're going to plan to kill mom, my mother and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Hey, mothers die. So she had this whole long, you know, day, page after page. And this was the one that the people keep talking about. Um, uh, this is the day of the happy event. I am writing a little. Oh, shoot. I, I, found, I had a I had a version of this, which I could actually read. Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, but basically she's saying, this is, this is, um, I'm writing this in, in ahead of the event. I feel very excited. It's like the night before Christmas because this is the last night. Um, so fascinating that she's excited that she's going to kill her mother the next day. So she left this entire diary of exactly what they were planning and how they were going to do it. So there was no question that they did it and that they planned it. Both of them planned it. There's not even a question of that, but the, the, the real question came down to was, A, who, who was in control of whom? Some people think that um, Pauline controlled Juliet. Some people think Juliet controlled Pauline. Um, and then what kind of, what kind of um, psychology did these two girls have to commit this kind of crime? Um, so that's what I want to talk about now. It is my belief that Juliet was the stronger of the two. Whenever you have a pair, you always have a stronger one. I believe it's Juliet. Um, Juliet uh, was the one who enticed uh, Pauline. Pauline was enthralled by Juliet. Juliet uh, made the decisions, most of the decisions. Uh, Pauline went along with most of the decisions. I think at the point where Pauline said, mother is getting in the way. Juliet was willing to allow Pauline to develop her desire to get rid of mom. And then she was willing to help her because then she had her pet. I believe Ju uh, Pauline was her pet in this when you talk, slightly unequal relationship. Um, but again, what would cause these girls to, to be the way they are? Um, oh, Annie's here. Hi, Annie. Um, the, and says there was no love in those girls' home. Oh, we talked about that. So it could kill and be liberated. Yes, but still, that's that's a hell of a, a hell of a place to go. Um, let me say, let's say, wait a minute. Oh, that's a good point. Uh, a year, Julie says, is forever at that age. It's unimaginable. That is true. That is true. Um, Ann Liebman says uh, my best friend wanted me to go out of town for university and wanted me to go as well. Oh, she wanted to go out of town. Wanted me to go as well. My mother said over my dead body. I wasn't allowed to leave town, so I didn't. I went to my room and sulked. But you didn't kill your mom. So, so there you go. Um, oh, Lisa S. says, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll, I'll let that one go. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a chat room thing. I don't know what that means exactly. Um, uh, Anne says, I think in the 70s, because we had no internet and iPads, we had closer relationship with friends. That's a good point. Uh, people have relationships, computer or phones today. That's an interesting point. Um, uh, VLW says, it seems that fantasy life was all they had, little or no real life to balance their emotional excesses. You know, it's interesting. They did. 
They had horses to ride. Uh, they had money to be able to not find foods. Um, they went to school. Uh, there, were th there were things, but somehow, because of the lack of some, the attention of the parents and their lack of inability to, to meld with other people, then they melded with each other and that became their entire, entire world. Um, yeah. So that, that is where I think it, it all went wrong. Now, I want to talk about some of their issues. I'm going to go through, I put up a whole bunch of things here and I'm going to sort of read through them because, and I'm going to comment on them because this is, there's a lot of question as to what caused this whole thing. Um, so uh, forced to choose between the moral values of the community or pursuing the delusion, the patient rejects the moral values. They call these people paranoics, which is interesting because I don't understand whether I don't understand the word paranoid. I think it's more psychopath, psych, uh, psychopathic, um, more and more more uh, narcissistic than it is paranoid. Paranoid seems to be to me more something where you're literally paranoid that you don't you know you don't think you can't you don't you're ter terrified of reality. But so I don't agree with this. But this says this one uses the term. This is an old term. Paranoics have to they must follow the delusion wherever it leads. In other words, they don't like the world around them. And I agree with that. And they feel they're not succeeding in it. This is often very true for narcissists and for psychopaths. They don't feel the world offers them enough and they can't function in it well enough. Such persons may become amoral, antisocial, and in any community dangerous. I agree with that. In summary, this is one of the, oh, this is one of the, this was, this was the, um, this was a defense. The defense believed both the accused were folie à deux, Folie à deux means uh, a pair, a pair, a couple, a pair, uh, a couple. That is, it's an it's an interesting terminology. It's it's um called shared psychotic disorder. So it's folie à deux. So two people together develop this shared psychotic disorder. And in this case, the defense really pushed that they were homosexual because that seemed to be like, hey, if they're homosexual, they're clearly certifiably mental, <laughs> mental defectives. And that's what he tried. To, that's what he tried to say, which is which I think is ludicrous. Um, uh, so now this was an interesting point uh, that the this is what the the um, the other side came up with. The prosecution questioned Juliet Hume with some delicacy, and she seemed to have no idea what I was talking about. When he asked her directly about physical homosexual practices, she looked very surprised. Her actual words were, but how could we? We're both women. Now. She could be just a good faker because I think she probably can lie really well. But again, in my day, if somebody had asked me, you know, did you, did you do anything naughty with a girlfriend? I might go. And they'd go, well, are you homosexual? I go, How, how's that possible? I mean, no, no, we can't, we couldn't do that. So yeah. Um, so the next thing is, Oh, sorry. That's the one I was looking for before. Okay. This is an interesting point. Uh, this has not. This is a. This is about different teenage killers. Four teenage killers they were talking about ha, were homosexual, which I think is is silly because lots of teenage killers are not homosexual. Had rich fantasy lives. This is a point I wanted to point out. Had rich fantasy lives, indulged in play acting, and saw themselves as Superman. Superman. A lot of serial killers love comics because the comics allow them to pretend that they're superheroes. Maybe the bad guy, bad superhero, but they're going to be a superhero somehow. Um, they like that fantasy. All exhibited, this is important, arrogance, feelings of omnipotence, and gross exaltation that continued after the murders and during their trials. Yes, serial killers feel this way, and a lot of this teens feel this way too when they, they when they commit or they kill their parents or they go and commit a mass murder. Or these two girls, they were still excited. These two girls were not showing remorse after this trial. They're like... Wasn't that the coolest? So those feelings that we still did something great. We did something together. We did something bigger than society. That is that is a good sign of what you I would consider some high level of narcissism and possible a psychopathy. Um, now, Perry says, oh, uh, this is, um, okay, wait a minute. This is, this is actually um, uh, Juliet. Mother was going with Bill. I was going to South, mother was having this affair. So mother was going off with Bill. I was going to South Africa. When Pauline heard her, her world fell apart. I really thought she would take her life. She had bulimia. She was throwing up after every meal. I knew it was stupid. I felt trapped. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was stupid. 
I knew I'd have to pay for it, but I didn't see any other way. I couldn't go to my mother or father. I couldn't walk away. I did something stupid. I will regret the rest of my life. I cannot undo it. This is how she's trying to get out of the fact that she cooperated. So now she's blaming, Juliet is blaming uh, Pauline saying, you know, you were so desperate. Now, I just went along because I was your best friend and I was trying to save your life. Okay. Um, now, this is this is another point. Such an upbringing, this is the type of girl's upbringing, can be expected to produce an avoidant attachment character style. Avoidant attachment being that that when you're when you're small, um, there's an attachment disorder where, where you don't get that attachment to your parents, especially your mother. And this happens a lot with uh, like the Russian Russian adopted kids. Um, they came from Russia. They were in an orphanage and weren't being cared for very well. They were left in their cribs just unattended. And then they were adopted out to American families who ended up with little psychopaths. And they're like, what the heck? You know, and they're like, that's because they never attached um, to anybody. And so they had this particular situation. They were avo uh, avoidant attachment. Avoidance, as they are called, have shut down their emotions to defend themselves against further injury. Uh, now, these girls had emotions toward each other, but a lot of emotions were shut down toward anybody else. Those people didn't matter uh, at all. Avoidant attachment is known to be at the heart of narcissistic personality disorder. The diagnostic cr criteria of which are grandiose sense of self-importance. We, we saw that with a poem, didn't we? Um, preoccupation with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, and beauty. Again, my God, these girls were totally into, we're the best, we're the smartest. And Juliet actually was beautiful and smart. And, you know, <laughs> Pauline, not so much. But by being together, they they became one entity of brilliance and beauty and you know, powerful, powerful goddesses. Um, the belief the person is special and unique excessive need for admiration, arrogance, and haughtiness, a sense of entitlement, a lack of empathy for others, and exploitation of others for selfish needs. All factors that seem to square with young Juliet's personality. Yeah. So I say Pauline had some of that, but Juliet had all of that, which is why I believe Juliet is very high on, if, look at the continuum of narcissism. I think Juliet's way toward the end of it. Um, can I call her a psychopath? I can't call her that, but she leans toward that. Uh, but I think that um, Pauline leans a little bit more toward borderline personality. Um, and uh, there's a couple other things I want to talk about here. Just a minute. Let me just go for, through this first. Psychopathic traits are closely related to narcissism. Yes. A psychopaths are often articulate and charming. That was Juliet. They lie glibly and convincing. Also Juliet. In some types, violent behavior is likely to be premeditated rather than impulsive. Fearlessness and lack of conscience and remorse are common. Juliet, it wasn't her mother who was destroying her life. I think with, with um, Pauline, she had so much anger and frustration and she could not stand to lose Juliet. So she was willing to kill her mother for it. She was desperate. Juliet, not so much. Juliet was more like, all righty, we'll do that. <laughs> um, and in terms of character, Pauline was an anxious ambivalent. That's an interesting terminology. Rather than being unwilling to become emotionally close to others, the ambivalent is desperate to have close relationships. Although for fear, no one would want to get close to them. They can act in a superior standoffish way. And she wasn't easy to get to know, but she desperately wanted somebody. Ambivalence, inner feelings of self-worth are sometimes so lacking. They see themselves as loathsome, unclean, and even poisonous. While drawn to relationships with others, they handle them incompetently. Friendships can be destroyed by eruptions of irrational rage. Jealousy and clinginess often drive people away. Uh, it is believed that ambivalence, the character shaping trauma, occurred later in life than it did for avoidance. That their mothers were less rejecting. And that is true. Because actually, with Juliet, she really, their mother really dumped her. And with, with, with um, Pauline, her mother was there. She was trying, but just things just always didn't always work real well. Um, mothers of ambivalence blow hot and cold. And that is very true for, for, uh, for Pauline. Um, and then the inconsistent rewards. Eating disorders often come up. Uh, let me go over here. Uh, nah, that's what we sort of no, they're very concerned about that. Yeah, don't leave me. Don't leave me. I hate you, but don't leave me. <laughs> um, 
Borderlines grow up with unstable self-image and, and acquire a history of stormy personal relationships. So she had, uh, so what happened with, with Pauline, she had problems with her, with her, with her mother. That was a really stormy relationship. Um, and let's see what else do I want to talk about here. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, that, that is probably not true. Uh, let me see if there's anything here. Um, oh, this is a, this is a good point. During the trial, the housekeeper believed that Juliet's main consideration was to completely take over someone such as Pauline as a shadow person. I believe that's true. I believe Juliet was in control and she loved this little shadow that she got in Pauline. But Pauline had to be in the shadow. Pauline had to have the sun. If she couldn't have the sun, she would die. That's why her mother had, she had to get mother out of the way because she had to be with the sun. And the sun is like, uh, I would miss my shadow. So I'm willing to help her out. Um, let's see. Pauline, this is very true. Pauline wanted to be like Juliet, and Juliet was more than willing to colonize her, transplanting her thoughts, opinions, taste in music, films, literature, everything else. That's, uh, so they they merged together, but definitely Juliet. Uh, Juliet, for her part, needed another person to help maintain her inflated self-image, and the twinship relationship served her narcissistic needs, while Pauline was willing to adopt all her likes and dislikes, ideas and philosophies to be with the son. Um, let me see. There's one more thing. Uh, this guy named Kohut, I don't know who this is, called this twinship transference. The more alike the two people became, the more they love each other. Well, of course, if person, if you're getting along with them and that person is mirroring you or you're mirroring them, you become like one person. Fascinating. Um, he and others who followed him observed that some of the great romances in history had nothing to do with love in the mature, senseless, selfless sense, but were in essence narcissistic, narcissistic based on self-love. So they that I need this so badly, I want you. Uh, not that I necessarily love you. Um, okay. All right. So that, I believe that that is probably the, uh, these concepts I think are really good. I think that my opinion, Juliet leans toward the very end of the narcissistic stuff. She exhibits traits of uh, psychopathy. And I think, uh, uh, Pauline tends to lean toward borderline personality disorder, also a high level of nar narcissism, but that, and together we have the sun and the shadow. And I think that fits very well to why they did what they did. And it's also interesting to see how that worked out after they left prison. What do you think happened after they left prison? All right. So this I find totally fascinating. So after they left prison, all right, we have these two lives diverge. They weren't allowed to supposedly, when they got out of prison, they weren't allowed to com communicate ever. That was the deal that you never can ever, ever get together again. <laughs> so years later, we have this. We have Juliet, finely dressed, put together. We have Pauline hiding away on a little teeny farm. I think it's somewhere in England. And she says she's got some horses and she wouldn't talk to anybody. She's very angry through her sister. Her sister said she has remorse for killing her mother. She became a very strong Catholic and hid away. What happened to Juliet? And this is the, the fascinating part of it all. And this is where, why does, why does the, the guy who wrote the story, uh, write the, wrote this great book, The Murder of the Century. Why does he say Anne Perry and the Murder of the Century? It's because Juliet became an author. This was one of her first books, The Cater Street Hangman. Her name, she changed her name to Anne Perry. She has sold over 20 million books. She's a rich lady <laughs> and she's um, a famous author. And people did not know that she was Juliet. She wrote for years without anybody knowing it. But when that film came out, Heavenly Creatures, her secret blew up. That's what happened. The secret completely blew up. Now, um, what happened after the secret blew up? And this shows you some of, of Juliet's character. Um, hold on a second. What is this? Hold on a second. Um, yeah. <laughs> murder story I had to hide for 40 years. Well, what's interesting is here's what she said. 
let me let me show you what she said. Let me find see if I can find it here. Um, oh, hold on a second. Okay. Um, wait a minute, hold on a second. One second. Oh, all right. After this came out, immediately the you know her agent and her, and her publicist came up with this. Perry has an insight that few crime writers can boast of. Perry committed murder in 1954. Her name back then was Juliet Hume, played by Kate Winslet in the film Heavenly Creatures. A bold sub uh, sub headline informed readers: Her intimate knowledge of good and evil has brought literary acclaim. <laughs> that is brilliant. I mean, they just, they took they took bad bad you know bad publicity and made a fortune. She'd only sold like three million books up there. All of a sudden, she sold like a son of a gun. She really sold a lot. Here's what she said. Um, he worried far too much, Ann Perry would say, of her outing. It was the best thing that could have ever happened because now I feel free. There's nothing to be afraid of anymore in the middle of the night. Well, you notice she didn't out herself. She wasn't willing to do that. And she says, oh, the murder story had to hide for years. Oh, wait, she just started making, she started playing this for all it was worth. Okay, let's see what else it says here. Um, oh, then they asked her. This is a question they asked her later, which I think shows you who she is. Did she ever think of her victim? Her answer was no. She was somebody I barely, does she, no, no, sorry. Did she ever think of her victim? No, she was somebody I barely knew. You brutally murdered this woman when you were a teen. If I can remember a sad moment when I was a teen or, or a horrifying moment when I was a teen, are you telling me you don't, this image, this whole video in your head of you bludgeoning this woman and strangling her isn't huge in your brain that you hardly think about her because she didn't know her? Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute again. Somebody I barely knew. She was your best friend's mother. You met her many times. And now you claim you barely knew her. And it reminds me of a person who was a suspect in a, in a, in a sexual homicide. And this fellow, this was a case that was started me in my career. I asked the guy because he... He had walked down the path the girl was murdered on at the time she was murdered. I asked him, oh, I said, when I first found out, I didn't think of him as being possibly involved. I just, but I said to him, I said, oh my God, were you on the path of that girl was murdered? He goes, yeah, but I, I didn't think anything about it because it's not anybody I knew. So I didn't care. And I remember thinking, <laughs> who says that? What kind of person says that? What kind of person says this? Did she ever think about her victim? No, she was somebody I barely knew. <sighs> wow. Then she says this too. This is interesting. This is in her one of her books. In Ann Perry's other crime series, Inspector Monk, like Pitt, regards the capacity to commit murder as a test of character. In A Dangerous Morning, he ruminates that, quote, to care for any person or issue enough to sacrifice greatly for it was the surest sign of being wholly alive. So in this, she's still saying, I cared so much about my friend, Pauline. I was willing to, to, I was most alive because I was willing to kill for her. But of course, she doesn't think about the victim very much because she didn't mean anything. I find that fascinating. Um, so it, it, the, so I, I just like, like just kind of like, what, you know? So one other thing I did want to point out here this is uh, this is Ann Perry's site. If you go to Ann Perry's site, it says here, um, I was born in London, England. I spent my earliest years moving around a bit, a bit, around a lot, and during and immediately after the war. At age six, I was severely ill, so much so that the doctor told my mother he would be back in the morning to sign my death certificate. However, I had a lot more illnesses, and at eight, I was sent to the Bahamas to live with a family who fostered me, and this saved my life. After the Bahamas, they moved to a private island off of the coast of New Zealand, where I lived a Swiss family Robinson style of independence. We did a lot of fishing, building, boating, etc. By the time I was 10, I had missed three years of schooling. Fortunately, my mother had taught me to read and write by the time I was four, so I always loved books and was able to catch up. However, at 13, I became ill again and I was uh, was off school from then on. So that may be of some encouragement to those who had 
miss so much of their education and on onward. <laughs> that's a fantasy life if I ever heard one because she's not talking about what really happened. And that's on her website today, uh, which I find fascinating. Um, now, when, when the guy wrote the, the book, the book that I really, really like, all right, um, uh, let's, where is it here? Okay, here we go. Um, so he wrote this book, right? And the people, there are a huge amount of Ann Perry fans out there. And I started reading this book. I did get it because it was fairly cheap from Amazon. I started reading it. It's not my thing, but I can see she's a very, very excellent writer. She is. And she she discusses a lot of evil and good and and, and emotions. And she's, she's pretty good at it. I'm, I'm going to give her credit. She can write. She can write. But here's, but because she's, he's got a lot of these um, uh, one-star reviews and, and I've experienced this myself when people don't like you for, you know, messing up whatever they think uh, they write you some really nasty reviews. So this is my favorite one. Somebody wrote disgusting. It appears to me the author was out to make money from the misery of others. <laughs> the book serves no purpose to me other than destroying lives. The part whose life could he be destroying? Oh, that he mentioned Ann Perry murdered somebody. Yeah. Well, that was already, she was already outed on that. He's telling the entire story of history. Um, funny, the author could have at least acknowledged the people written about. What? Maybe a thanks for allowing the invasion of their privacy. Oh, wait, they didn't allow the invasion. I don't even know what she's talking about. Just my opinion, but I was disturbed that after 50 years, there still appears to be a need to not forgive. Maybe because she doesn't have any remorse and doesn't remember her victim hardly at all. That she murdered. I will continue to buy Ann Perry books. <laughs> so that's how you get one star reviews. That's how you, that's how you lose subscribers from YouTube. When, when you, when you talk about a case and the people disagree with you, they're like, to unsubscribe, unsubscribe, <laughs> one star review, one star review. <laughs> and it's, and it's pretty, can be pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing to watch sometimes. So I think that book is excellent. I really do. And uh, I say, I'm not a big true crime fan of reading a lot of these books. They often bore me, but I thought his was really, really well written. I really, really do. So anyway, to me, what we have here is we have two damaged girls, two teens who are living their teen life, their fantasy life, which is not abnormal, but they found each other and that, that intensified everything. And then they ran and they had the wrong, some wrong ideations and they were already suffering from narcissistic personality disorders of, of the nth degree. And then the situation came up, which would separate them and ruin their plans. And they took care of it, or they thought they did badly, mind you. Um, uh, she's improved writing, writing, uh, murder, mur uh, murder plans now. <laughs> she, I mean, and Perry. So I'm, I'm thinking she has better plots now than how they figured out how they were going to kill, um, Kill, kill Pauline's mother and didn't do such a good job of it and got caught immediately. Um, so I think she's improved her, 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 um, her methodology of plan, planning a murder. Uh, luckily she doesn't actually commit murders anymore, but um, I don't know that she is not who she still is. Um, and she's not, she's not still who she is. People don't just change completely. So I, they, they're not dangerous anymore in the sense that as long as they don't run into another situation like that, uh, they can live out their lives in some sane way, um, some you know, uh, non-dangerous way, um, and even become a great author. Do I think she, they should have spent the rest of their lives in prison? We can argue that point. Um, they were teenagers when this happened. If they had been adults, would they have made the same choice? Or because of this, what I what I pointed out, these three things coming together, did this push them over the edge at a time when they, a person with persons with uh, personality disorders can't think straight? It's 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 a real tricky thing as to how long somebody should be in prison for for doing things. But a woman was brutally murdered. Uh, she was you know she lost her life. Uh, the her her two sisters lost their mother. The man who wasn't quite married to her lost his, his significant other. They did they did tremendous damage. I don't know if five years was 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 enough, but that's that's a matter of contention. Now I want to go to your comments on this. Um, let me see what you have to say. Ah, oh, goodness. Uh, yes. Um, uh, Folie. Julie says Folie au deux. I think I don't know how well I'm pronouncing this. I wonder about that with Chad Daybell and Lori Daybell. 
Yes. Again, if you the two hadn't come together, did you did you check check my um uh my 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 uh, video on that? But we have personality disorders with those two as well, and then they came together, and then that's where things got really bad. But they're not teenagers, and they've had a long history of personality disorder, both of them. So I feel a lot less sorry for them. <laughs> Poor old Pauline, th thrown under the bus. Yeah, she was. Um, uh, Julie says, Pauline was grist to Juliet's mill then. Yeah, I would say that would, could be correct. Um, <laughs> oh, CJ says, I can't stay, but just wanted to let you know it's a petition on change.org uh, change to stop the Can Casey Anthony docuseries. That's not going to happen. I don't care how many people sign it. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's no effect they're going to have on on peacock uh, putting out casey anthony duck the series when they're going to make a crap load of money and some people don't like it like me and you uh, <laughs> um let's see uh her indifference is disgusting yes i i find that problematic and that but see she might not be able to help that because that's who she is um she could come up with a better story about how sad she was but apparently that's not quite what she's out, always able to do um lisa n says although this case is from my country I had no interest in it until this show you did a great job analyzing it especially the teenage brain and hormones aspect yeah i'd like some of that hormone stuff back <laughs> you know it was so weird it's like it was like a i just remember it being this warm buzzy thing you know, it's like it's like maybe you were taking drugs, but you weren't, you know, and your whole system was alive. And yeah, there's, there's super excitement about it. And then you get older and you're like some. Yeah, <laughs> I, I want it back. <laughs> I want some of it back. Um, but, uh, let's see. Let's see what else we have here. Just uh, look at my. Um, I think that's where we are. Um, oh, it seems like Pauline, yeah, this is true, Lisa. It seems like Pauline almost became a modern day nun, retreating into her Catholicism and avoiding contact with people. Most likely to, to be remorseful of the two of them. Yes. Um, I think that she may have more remorse, although we can't be sure of that. She did really, really become Catholic and it may be, but again, it may be because this is her way of being important. She's unable to succeed in other ways, and she can be that in her own mind. We have to say we're own mind. We're that special person. So it's really hard to go back and say how remorseful anybody is. But um, yeah, it's hard to say. It really is. Um, the, the LW says, yes, I can feel pity for Pauline. I, I, you know, as vicious as Pauline was toward her mother, I, I agree. I think it's a little more understandable. And it, it, well, then again, I think her mother was actually worse. I mean, her mother was very, very so self-centered and narcissistic, in my opinion, that she, they dumped her over and over again. I mean, they dumped her for year, years at a time, months at a time, ignored her. I mean, she really didn't have, she had, they had money. And she had education, but she didn't have love. She didn't. And so I think her mother was way worse than her mother. Her mother was just frustrated. And I don't know. It's hard to say. Sometimes when you have a that kid, that kid who's got a personality disorder, suffers from that, they're not fun to be around. And so the mother gets more and more frustrated. So it becomes more and more attention. So I don't know. Um, and, and to make the decision to murder is, is pretty awful. She did it in rage, and anger, and, you know, yeah, you can't, I, this will, I can have my, 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 my relationship. She, and the, yeah. So I do in a way feel that she had more, uh, less control. She, I figure, feel is more like an ice princess had total control. Um, uh, were Pauline or Juliet violent before or after the murders? Uh, that's a good question, Molly. Uh, Juliet, absolutely not. Um, Pauline had outbursts, but neither of them did anything like assault people or hit their or their, their 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 siblings or any of that. Um, she was just she was mouthy. She was arrogant. People don't like the arrogant. She is entirely arrogant. She tended to be more just depressed and angry at the world and and and, and mouthy, but in a 
angry way. So, yeah. Um, oh, I'm glad. Oh, you read that one. Okay. I think the book is excellent. And I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm a pretty good critic. And I mean, I don't like people criticizing my books. <laughs> like people do. Uh, <laughs> other people do. But, you know, so I try to, I do criticize books saying, you know, that one didn't quite work for me. I try to be fair. Um, but, you know, when I do run into something really good, I like to say it's really good. And I, I just was very impressed with this particular uh, person's writing. It wasn't, um, it wasn't overly graphic or anything and very interesting. It's a, you know, it's a thorough book. It's thorough and it, had, it was good. It was, it was well written. I, I just, um, and I, I, yeah, I think so too. I think it was really well written. Um, but this is, um, I think we need, we could learn something from this. And what I mean by learning this is we understand the dangers of those teen years when you have those three things that come together. We have to prevent them. First of all, we, we can't prevent just being a teen and having those normal feelings. We can prevent a child from growing into a dangerous teen. And we can prevent that by not having, having a good family for the child, having a mother and father who care, having love there, having them be there, having a safe situation. Um, that child grows up then secure and loved then they don't then when they become a teen they can handle it but if you have a child with a personality disorder already by five they're starting to struggle uh they're showing it even by three sometimes and then by the time they get to be a teen they can become very dangerous and then if you add in that third thing the bad ideation or a situation they can't handle so you have a boy and girl get together they're madly in love and and then the girl's parents say, you can't see him anymore because he's way too old for you. And she says, well, bring your sword over and, and could you uh, cut up my parents? And he comes over and he take, brings a little sword and wipes the parents out. That's a problem. Or you get a child who gets to this age and he's got an obsession with death and blood and everything. And, and, and you get a, a girl, I think a teenage girl, why not kill the younger teenage girl? just for the fun of it, to see what it was like to kill. So you got it. These three things are really important. So what you want to make sure is that you're going to have this, no matter what you do, the teen, just being a teen, but you might, how they grow up and what they get as a teen for ideation and situations, let you know whether they can survive those teen years without becoming um, dangerous human beings. So, um, Yes, they, they were emotionally neglect, neglected children. They really were. They were. And so so both parents had, had a part, part to play in this. They definitely did. Uh, you know, when you have children, you, you're to provide a good place, place for those children. And if you don't, that's on you. Um, so, but unfortunately, you know, once that happens and these children get to be enough of an age where they can commit a crime, then what do you do? They're committing crimes and they're, they're taking other people's lives away from them. And so that's, that's not acceptable either. So, but this is what I hope people get out of this is, is how this all works. And um, a more, a, as much of a realistic version as I can present, that's understandable to people. So anyway, that's it for tonight. And um, thank you for being here. Um, and thank you for everybody out in Oceania, <laughs> Australia, New Zealand, who are actually awake for this show um, and for everybody else who's in the U S and who's awake. And I'm sure uh, my, my good friends in uh, uh, UK and Europe, they're, they're like asleep, so they're not going to be here, but um, I'm glad everybody else was able to make it. So um, yeah, that, that's a, this is, this is a final good point. No, no excuse, just tragic. Yeah. That that's pretty much where you're, where you're at. You, you can't excuse it, but you can understand the tragedy of it all. Um, so most welcome, Carrie. Thank you most and most welcome Jim and most welcome Lisa and I'm glad you like the show and uh, yeah I thought this was a fascinating case and um, so if you're here today um, yeah coming up is a uh, Sunday is the the Dahmer special so it's um, uh, profiling Jeffrey Dahmer so I hope to see you whoever's here today I hope to see you on Sunday at 3 p.m. EST and if you're watching this later just check out the Dahmer video because it'll be up somewhere around the time, you, a little after you see this, or maybe you'll see this in three years. And, you know, you just, just know there's other videos out there. And if you're interested in anything particularly, um, go to the search engine on YouTube and put in profiler Pat Brown and whatever case you're interested in. 
and click there and see if I've done the done that uh, particular case. Um, and always, you can always send me your case ideas. And I'm trying to, I'll try to do them at some point. I have a huge list now, but I'm trying to get to them all over time. Most welcome, Florence. And I'll see you next time, guys. And um, yeah, it was uh, yeah, not a whodunit, but a why did they do it night. So see you next time. <laughs>